John Gormley here in Saskatchewan and other corporate media. And today I have another special guest, uh, one that has been on my show before and hopefully is still there. Uh, Larry Newfeld, are you still with us? I'm still here. And so Larry has been on the show before, but the last time you were on the show, uh, there was quite a few other people along with you. And so we really didn't get a chance to go too much into your background and who you are and why, perhaps especially in Regina, people should probably have heard of you at the very least. So who are you and where were you recently running and for what? Let's start with that. Well, I would say I've been sort of very active with the Green Party, beginning with the provincial side of things before moving on to federal. About 2015-ish, I think I got involved with the party originally and uh, ran as a, a candidate in 2016 for a period of time was also the uh, deputy leader of the Saskatchewan Green Party. Cool. And uh, before I left that, and then I became the CEO of uh, Regina Louvain Federal Green Party of Canada. So that's what I'm currently involved with at the moment. And uh, and also I recently uh, ran as a candidate in the provincial election. And, and and so, for, yeah, yeah. so for those following along, we just had an election this past week or so here in Saskatchewan where... The And in fact, it is still going on. There are still votes being counted. It was a SAS party majority, as probably could have guessed it was going to be coming into the election. But because of COVID and because of all the mail-in votes, there is still a lot of votes to be counted. And I'm just looking at the Election Saskatchewan website right now, and there's been 40,209 vote-by-mail ballots counted out of 61,255 votes issued. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean all of the other... 21,000 odd votes are going to be counted because in order to be counted, there has to be a lot of things done correctly. There has to be a signature on both sides of the ballot. They have to be the same signature. And a lot of things are checked to make sure that when someone sent a vote, that that vote is a legitimate vote and is actually counted. But in your particular constituency in Regina, which one was that? Well, actually, I did run in the city of Regina this time. I did run as the candidate like in 2016 in a Regina constituency, but I actually ran in a rural one this time. Okay, so which riding rurally in Saskatchewan was this? Uh, that would have been Roster and Shelbrooke. <laughs> I ran against actually Scott Moe. Okay, so you more than probably anyone else in the province then, other than maybe the NDP candidate in that riding, actually tried to de-seat and defeat Scott Moe personally, which you got to get some kudos and credit for that. Uh, I wouldn't have even thought it was possible to do that from the city, but 
so do you have a connection to Ross Stern uh, Shelbrook, or is it just like a being in Regina running there sort of thing? Well, due to COVID, I wasn't uh, doing like a lot of things like in person. I do have a pre-existing condition and it's me, uh, rather vulnerable to COVID-19. So I wasn't comfortable with doing like in-person campaign work. But they said, well, if you want a challenge, we're looking for somebody for the Ross Stern Shelbrook. And it's like, Sign me up. No well, I can do some. I can do online campaigning. I can do like phoning and talk to people if I need to. I don't have a problem doing that. I said, okay, let's see what we can do. And so taking a step back there. Now, a lot of people have heard of the Green Party federally here in Canada. Elizabeth May has done, I think, a pretty good job of making people at least aware that in some areas of the country, it is not only possible, but likely to get a Green Member of Parliament elected if enough people are interested in doing so. But here in Saskatchewan, one, I'm finding a lot of the people that I talk to don't even realize that we have a Green Party uh, provincially. And so what, for those people who have n- either never heard of or didn't know that we had a Green Party here, what exactly does the Green Party stand for here? The Green Party in Saskatchewan uh, stands for, well, we're very concerned with climate change issues, but we're not all about climate change. We're also looking to eliminate poverty. We're very progressive. We were actually running on one of our main things in our platform was a GLI, a guaranteed livable income program. That was one of the things. So that's a big concern for ours is tackling poverty in the province, dealing with issues of that nature. Also, we were trying, we also had a platform uh, geared towards addressing indigenous issues, improving education in the province. So those are all things that we're very concerned with. We, our principles of nonviolence are very important to us as well. We abide by the Global Greens Charter. Those are core beliefs is the environment, nonviolence, ending inequality, uh, working with the indigenous communities, building that partnership. So these are all very uh, important issues. That's sort of an, an overall umbrella of what the Green Party is about. Very grassroots oriented. Mm-hmm. Like we want, that is like what we're geared towards is trying to meet people where they are, find out what their issues are, like on the ground. That's of a concern to us, not being in an ivory tower and going like, oh, well, this looks like a good policy for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and so just like as an example yeah. of that at the federal level, I don't know if the provincial has level has done something similar, but I recently got an email from the federal Green Party. And although I do think that they think that I'm a member, even though I'm not actually, as far as I know, a member, they sent me an email basically saying, what should the Green Party policy be? And just like as an open question of person on the internet who is a Canadian citizen and possibly involved in the Green or once supported the Green like 10 years ago, what should the platform be? And, I've, and it just like... Like, took me aback because, like, certainly none of the other parties have done that. Like, there, there have been cases where the other parties have reached out to the public for ideas and stuff like that, but never in such an open and blatant way, right? Mm-hmm. And so, back on the provincial level, though. So, given now you're becoming kind of further and further involved with and higher and higher in the, the, the Green Party apparatus as grassroots as it it currently is. What made you start down the path towards being involved with politics? And how did you get started on this? Like, where did this all start? Uh, I'd say, like, getting more deeply involved in politics actually began with with an invite that I had just, like, to a barbecue, basically, that a friend was having, well, was involved with a member of the Green Party, and he said, hey, would you like to come to this barbecue thing? It's like, oh, okay, you know, free food. (laughs) You know, it's like, I like barbecue, so I thought I'd go to it. And I had well, a little bit of an interest, like in politics, and I started talking with a few people there. It's like I, I really like the people there. It's like very down to earth people. He seemed like the kind of people where it's like they very accepting and wanted to know you and get to know you better. And I got in a little more involved. It's like, well, I'd like to know a little bit more about the Green Party and what it's all about. And so uh, they had some meetings and stuff. I went to an executive meeting that the Green Party had and I sat in on that just to listen to what they all did and everything. And it's like, well, this seems very interesting. And it's like I, I haven't been too happy with the. What have been happening like in politics well there's always like here both at the federal city and provincial level there's always things about the political system just generally here in canada where it's a very competitive competitive system it's not as bad as the states and we don't hear and see the vitriol hate that you do see in the states around election time which for those following along this is also the week of a u.s election federally there and i mean we've got it better than there but it's still there are other places in the world that for example governments that are blanking on the word coalition government yeah coalition governments are more common that there's more small parties so that there's more of a kind of freedom from the two party you're either with us or against us that it is predominant here in saskatchewan because of the two main political parties here and so on and so forth so 
a party that is willing to entertain people who are not members and who already don't drink the Kool-Aid, that sort of thing, it can be a very refreshing thing, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I should mention that as well. The, the Greens are very interested in like in this electoral reform and proportional representation. So that checked another box off is like this, like you were saying, the view of cooperation and we're getting everybody around the table to create solutions. So I had some interest in politics, in, but I was attracted to it by, due to the fact that these were down-to-earth people and people that seemed like they really wanted to make a difference. And that appealed to me because if I was going to get involved in something, I wanted to do something where I could make a difference to improve people's lives. Like I've done like volunteer work, like with Amnesty International, like Regina, a few organizations, things that I like to be involved in where I, where I can make a difference. And that was what sort of drew me into politics. It's like people that cared and wanted to make a difference and working towards some real change in the system to improve people's lives. So I wasn't into politics looking at it as like, oh, this is a great career move or something like that. I was like, what can I do to get involved and help people improve their lives? And they eventually get to the point where uh, they were looking for candidates and I threw my hat in the ring to for that. It was a contested nomination. I did win that for Regina Lakeview at the time, so I ran as a candidate there. And that's what got me involved. It was not a career move. People who probably want to be career politicians go for one of the, the traditional parties, I guess. But I was in it to maybe put some ideas forward that maybe the other parties would look at and maybe be interested in adopting or push other people to look at the looking at something better outside the traditional parties and motivate people to also adopt a view of working towards change in the political system. Because politics wields a lot of power over people's lives, um, either on a local level, a federal level, or a provincial level. And if you have a government that stands up for people and is not kowtowing to corporate or interests or anything like that, and stands up and says, I'm doing this to help people. We're doing, we're not in this like to grease the palms of the people in power. We're doing this to actually improve people's lives. Right. That's what politics should be about. And it has enormous power to either improve people's lives or it can actually make people's lives a lot worse. And so from that improve slash um, <laughs> making people's lives worse, one of the things that you mentioned that both the Green Party's involved in, that you're personally involved in uh, with the Basic Income Coalition, and that has been kind of an interest of yours generally, is this idea of a basic income. So specifically of a basic income, what would that do to improve slash, like what would the impact of a basic income system be on the people of a, of a city, state, province, etc., that would try it from your vantage point? Well, there was like, I don't know if you've heard of the original basic income pilot. It was called Mincom. And this was uh, the one in Manitoba, right? Yeah. So that was sort of, I guess, the early beginnings of like a basic income type program in Canada. And it, the data was kind of lost there for the longest time. And, but and, and this was really more. like the beginning of it. Like prior yeah. to that Mincom pilot project, the federal government did do some things, but there really wasn't anything in Canada's history, as far as I know, that approximates trying to improve the the life and the quality of life of its people through something like a basic income project, i.e. giving everyone a universal allowance, basically, so that at least there's that minimum standard of living that you get. And really, there was a very, very low minimum standard of living that was possible up until that point. The Regina riot was an example of like what can happen when basically everyone loses their jobs. But anyway, continue on the income side of things. Yeah, so that... They were wondering, like, well, what's going to happen with this? Are people just going to be sitting on their butts, just collecting checks and not doing anything? But it actually was used towards improving people's lives. Like, some people used it towards uh, paying for education. Some mothers could stay at home and they could look after their kids. And that helped to make sure that they had enough money to help out the family. So it was an improvement in that regard. So that they didn't have to look for uh, child care and, and pay for that. So they had that option. They could stay at home if they wanted to. Um, and, and, so, and I'm imagining that Manitoba is probably not too far from Saskatchewan in terms of child poverty. And it mm -hmm. is one of the sources of, like, we should be deeply embarrassed of how bad Saskatchewan's child poverty level is and how many children are trapped in cycles of poverty and do things like you know, missed meals, for example. And there is deep, deep poverty here that is just like just hidden barely under the carpet. And so if even if all it did was just like improve the rate of child poverty a little bit, that would be worth at least something, right? Oh, absolutely. It's shameful, like what's happening in Saskatchewan. And uh, also to touch on the fact that, well, you see what happened like with CERB, like we're, I'm jumping away from income at the moment, but looking at CERB, that 
in a way, that is like a basic income program, giving everybody the money to sort of make sure that you know, there's not an economic collapse. It, it was sort of rushed through, and they sort of patched it up here and there right. to try and address these issues. And yeah, it, it definitely would uh, prevent poverty, prevent child poverty and stuff. Having like a program and having serve in place has certainly kept people from losing their homes and stuff in cases, and having some money to put food on the table and pay for their bills. Okay, so like we had the the Mincom project in the seventies in Manitoba, and what was the results of that? Uh, you mentioned that they were kind of spotty and the data wasn't all that good, but like other than that, what came from that project? Well, when the they were able to get some of that information together, it, it did actually prove to be that it was it was a successful program. It actually had improved people's lives. Um, it had improved the quality of living for people, but due to the politics um, at the time, the program did get cut, so it sort of went by the wayside, and then it was never really revisited. It sort of was like shelved, and it sort of it was kind of a forgotten piece of Canadian history in, in a big way. And it's only like in recent years, as there was more interest that started generating in basic income, that people went back to look into what happened with him income, and it's like you know what. This didn't cause like a collapse of people sitting on their butts and not doing anything. It actually raised people up. They had a decent standard of living. Well, in, um, in addition to that, there was other similar things that have been tried since. Like, for example, I can't remember the name of the project, but it's basically like a, a charity that what it does is if you donate to this charity, there's some you know village in wherever in the middle of Africa in the, the poorest part of the world where they just like donate cash, mm -hmm. cash in hand to somebody in that village so that that person, instead of giving them food or instead of giving them clothing or instead of giving them medicine or anything that you would donate to any of the other charities specifically for, you just get cash in hand in that person's hand. And then whatever they do with that cash is up to them. It's just money. And then the question is, does that improve poverty? Does it improve the health and well-being of the people in that particular region? And by and large, their data, at least in my understanding of it, is yes, it does. And that if you want to have an impact on the world, one of the things you can do is donate money to this charity because, you know, $5 spent in this charity, very close to 100% of it goes to the purpose of that charity, i.e. giving it to someone who's poor and needs that money, right? And the spillover effects of having less desperate and starving people because they have a little bit of a helping hand has proven, at least in my understanding, to be a valid way of decreasing the amount of poverty in the world. And so that is something that happened in the meanwhile after this income project. But then the next thing is the Thunder Bay pilot project. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Or? Well, I know like Ontario, they've done some experimenting with it. I don't know a whole lot of details in regards to the Thunder Bay one. Okay. I do know something about what you were mentioning there. And I, if I remember right, I think they also, some of the people like in where this money was being donated, it actually, they use it towards starting businesses and stuff. So money, like this, this money, uh, not only uh, it generates more money for the economy, like it gets injected back into the economy, basically. Or, or just like even starts an economy, right? Like, if there's no like, economy whatsoever and all you yeah. have is a bunch of hungry, desperate people willing yeah. to steal and to kill and to whatever, right? Having a chance at anything of a hope for a living, I mean, that can make a huge difference. Again, if, if especially if you target directly at the poorest of the poor and the people who have really nothing and no hope and no chance otherwise. Yeah, well, it, it gets it gets spent. Like, if you gave like a million dollars to somebody who was a billionaire, it's like, oh, thank you, and it goes like into you know an offshore account or something, or they they save it. But if you give money to somebody who hasn't got a whole lot, they use that money. They use that immediately. It goes into like uh, buying goods and services. It immediately gets injected into the economy and it generates new jobs and new investment. So if you look at it from a right-wing perspective, you don't care about, oh, is it's improving people's lives and you just look at it purely from a monetary perspective, it makes a lot of economic sense, actually. If you got money sitting around doing nothing compared to money that's being used, it actually, uh, it's, it's better all around to just give the money. And it actually provides a, a lot of benefits. So not only does it improve people's quality of life, it also stimulates the economy because that money is being put to immediate use. And we can we like we can see it immediately like with SIR, which is not a basic income program. A number of people wish it would be turned into something like that. So you've you said that a couple of times win. on your Facebook feed that SERB isn't 
basic income and that, like you said, it can be turned into one, but what would it look like if, for example, the Trudeau government, after being maybe pressured by the NDP government to do so, decided to make it more like a basic income or a UBI or a GLI or whatever system, what would the changes be to make it closer to that? Well, they would make it permanent. Like, it would be an across-the-board like income provided to everybody, not just targeted to somebody who's just been put out of work due to a pandemic, but anybody uh, would be able to be able to make use of it. And that it would be... They'd also have to negotiate with provinces, too. Like, you can't apply for a CERB, like in Saskatchewan. Like, if somebody was, like, told, hey, you should apply for this that was on social assistance, they'd be like, that wouldn't work. Or if you're well, on social assistance, they do a clawback on CERB. Right. It's not like you can keep that. So if we just applied, like... Serve, like across the country, you'd have to negotiate with provinces. It wouldn't be like a clawback. And it was just based on, um, it could be geared towards like how much you actually earn. And then it could be come back on your taxes later. Okay. So you're making tons of money. Which you don't really need It's that. actually kind of worth pointing out because I, I was talking about basic income with someone a couple of days ago and he was confusing it with the basic amount that you claim on your taxes if you are a income tax paying citizen and you basically get a certain amount of money that you can make without paying taxes or at least Ooh, income taxes no. on yeah. it. And then, so like there's yeah. this kind of naming clash that goes on in people's minds yeah. who have not heard of basic income when you yeah. start talking about it. But it's interesting though because they are kind of related in that way, right? Where like mm -hmm. at the end of the year, we do wind up paying or at least some of us wind up paying taxes on our income, and that the more or the higher this, this basic level is, is basically a level of uh, income that we, we can have without taxes basically being paid on it. So that there is this kind of level of equivalence there in terms of how much taxes we pay, etc. Now, in the case of a basic income, one of the things that you could do to implement it is to implement something like a negative tax bracket, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, yeah. if you make less than $20,000 a year, instead of paying income tax, you get income tax to bring you closer to a, a standard of living that is maybe equivalent to serve or higher or lower or whatever. But would that, is that how it would look? Or is there something more to it? Well, it'd be geared towards like raising people up to, uh, you know, so if you're not dropping below the poverty level, so it would have to be like applied in that way. And if you are earning well above that, then yeah, you're going to be, there's going to be like, it could be like geared towards like a level of clawback basically right. that, you know, this amount is, you're so much above this. So you're going to get this much of money taken out like a tax time basically. So it'd be like, but if you're, you got nothing else, this is all you got. And it's like, that's the money you have. And it's not going to, we're not going to come at you and go like, okay, this is money that we're going to deduct off. We're going to be putting in a lot of red tape basically for you to be able to apply for this. Make it simple, make it easy, make it accessible for people to make use of it. Now, and, back and, on and the, the tax, CERB tax system can do that. So was CERB easy and accessible in that sense? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the hoops you had to uh, like jump through for that, uh, the application process, it, there were so many headaches for so many people with that. It, and then uh, you had like EI mixed in with it too. This is when people were confused. Okay, am I getting, am I going to be like on the EI system here? And the EI system doesn't top up a little bit like with CERP. It was a mess. It was a total mess. Like they figured out some of it, how it would work, but it, it like trying to integrate it with EI and everything. Like it's, we have such an inefficient income security program like right now with with EI and then this was like basically CERP was brought in as uh, the filler basically right because it didn't work yeah. like it no. was basically an admission yeah. by the federal government that like our social security network the, the web that we should we pay into as as employees to get EI that it doesn't actually work and that when the push comes to shove that we cannot actually rely on it especially if a lot of people hit that that net at once and so CERB was kind of like the, the band-aid solution to get us through this like couple of months in the pandemic and it's been extended and expanded, et cetera. But we know there is a problem here. And on some level, we've got to do something about that problem. The only question is kind of what? Now, so stepping back a little bit, so I've got kind of like a little criticism of basic income on my side, which is especially given our previous conversation with Adam, where it was pointed out that like these basic income pilots tend to be expensive, whether it's Sur, whether it's in Thunder Bay, regardless of the benefits, like in a cost benefit analysis and grant that it's, it's, it makes sense in a cost benefit way, but it's still an expensive thing to get off the ground, et cetera. Now, would it make sense to instead of having something like Sur, where it's like 2000 bucks a month, to start smaller? to start at like 
maybe even 20 bucks a month. 100 bucks a month, something like that, where it would be much, I mean, way lower than the amount necessary to get you out of poverty, which is kind of what you said would be like the point to aim for, but just one step on the ladder or one step on the staircase out of that cycle. Uh, would that be a waste of time? Would it be like one step? What, what would be your perspective on that approach? Well, I think it speaks to just incrementalism, like doing something like that. We need to improve our social safety net now rather than going like, we're going to tweak it a little here. We're going to tweak it a little there. That gets us like in a bad spot like that we saw like with the pandemic. Okay, say we, we will eventually we'll get out of COVID. You know, that's down the line. But what's to say that some other disaster or something might happen? It could be disease related. It could be in, like climate related. Well, or it could even be like a political disaster, like what's happening on the yeah. East Coast right now with the fishermen, the Canadian fishermen burning and poisoning stock of the local First Nation there that I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I'll probably screw it up. But that sort of thing can spread and become a national crisis, right? And if we're having trouble with COVID and another national crisis hits us, we're in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that, and that just speaks to it. Like we've done the pilot projects, we've done them and we've seen that it is successful. We have, uh, but why put it in little contain, little containers and see, well, okay, let's, let's experiment with this a little more. We see that it, it actually does work and why not make it a permanent national basic income program? Do it now have that improvement in our social safety net available, ready to go. Not something that we have to go and roll out at the last minute to deal with a disaster that might emerge at some point. Why play like whack-a-mole with something? <laughs> Why not just know that this works, put it in place. It's kind of like get the legislation, get the legislation ready and see what, get it ready to go. Just do it. I'm kind of imagining it kind of like a, we know that smoking causes cancer. So why don't we just like not have the next cigarette? Right. I mean, does that actually help if you just miss one cigarette or is there a bigger problem that we know is a problem we need to actually do something about? So but taking another kind of step on the criticism side, though, there is, a, of course, a cost to this. And as mentioned by Adam in the previous show, like Canada's economy is taking a little bit of a hit from sir, or at least the, the federal budget is. But from your perspective, what is the economics of the cost? And what do we know based on the studies that we're done, et cetera, in terms of what allows us to pay for it and is it worth it from that standpoint? I haven't got the exact number like right now, but I know that the PBO, like the Parliamentary Budget Office, did do uh, like a study on what it would actually cost like to roll out like a form of basic income. And it is doable actually, and it's not something that would actually like wreck our economy or anything like that. And if we're looking for ways to actually fund this, if this is a big concern, then we have ways that we can actually do this. You look at corporations. We kept cutting taxes on corporations like that they are, it's ridiculous uh, the amount of tax that some corporations actually pay now. So that brings in billions of dollars that could be pumped into this. Savings and efficiencies and red tape from the EI system would also help pay for it. So it's not like, oh, you know, this money, we're not going to have it. It's not going to be available. We, it's, it's impossible to do. There are ways to actually fund this. It's not pie in the sky thing. And it wouldn't ruin the economy. And you, like I said before, that money gets pumped back into the economy. It is good money. It actually is very beneficial. So we can find a ways to fund this. The PBO said it was certainly doable and it was not something that was like uh, something ridiculous, a ridiculous pipe dream, but it was very much something that could be done. So it's like you can make the arguments like, oh, it's going to cost too much money, but how much is poverty costing us right now? You look at how much it costs like the justice system, how much it costs the social assistance system, how much it costs the health system. You look at all those costs and this is, this would be and, like- And, and those are just like the easy yeah. to measure ones too. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, I recently had someone in my life that was beaten to a, a bloody pulp by their ex-husband. And like that court case went on for many, many months. And like, it was to the point where even if he had somehow gotten convicted of this and sent to jail, he was just waiting for trial long enough that the amount, the justice system, both here in Saskatchewan and elsewhere in Canada, is so backed up. And there's so much injustice in that backup. And the impact of people's lives of where people basically can't get a sense of a community where they feel that the laws are even applicable, right? Where they can be just made into victims because of that backup. And a lot of that backup has roots in poverty in this systematic poverty, drug addictions, etc., that we could be dealing with if the underlying problems of poverty weren't operative there. But there's definitely a, a cost there. But Well, yeah, that's like the root causes. 
like you were saying, like if, you, if we deal with the root causes, that's it, it improves people's lives, but it also improves the economy too. So if you just want to look at it like purely from an economic perspective, if you want to look at it maybe from maybe people on the right wing like look at it more, show me the dollars and cents, show me the money type thing, then it does provide that as you deal with those root causes, it actually it does prove improve things economically by doing those things. It should be a no brainer, really. Uh, and it's been uh, like basic income isn't like a lefty thing. Here's the people on the right wing side of things too that have been like in support of this like Mr. Siegel uh, is a prominent conservative he's been in, in favor of it there's been people on the left wing that have been in favor of it it's something that uh, sort of goes across the board when you look at it it makes sense from different perspectives basically if your focus is on people and the social impacts it has on people's lives that it's an improvement if you look at it purely from an economic perspective it makes sense on what it does economically. It makes sense like from so many different ways. It's I think we do have like a good solid start, I think, to bring different parties together to actually get this done. Uh, and it's gaining steam. Like you see it now, there's more advocacy groups, there's more talk about basic income now. It's gaining more momentum than it ever did before. And the pandemic was just fueled in the tank, basically. It just it's because it, it became something that like everyone realized there's a personal impact there, right? Everyone yeah. in Canada either has been on CERB or knows someone who has been on CERB at this point. Everyone in Canada understands that oh hey, you can lose your job at the drop of a pin, and suddenly there's a need for a social safety net of some kind, and that a lot of people are starting to have their eyes open that yes, there are problems with the existing one. And so like it's becoming thinkable for a huge portion of the Canadian public that yes, we could do this. And if it works, it works. And where would we go to find out whether it works or not? Places like Thunder Bay, what happened in Thunder Bay, right? Where you had people, just like you said, they'd use it to get access to education that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, to have the ability to pay rent and then do other things like go out and buy healthier food, that sort of thing. And we have access to the ability to live a life that was that they did not have access to before that wasn't necessarily a waste but just a way to to have that standard of living improve and so it's interesting that there is this increasing or at least that we're getting closer to a consensus on this now is there any groups in canada that are like, opposed to this that you're kind of aware of? Uh, i don't concentrate on that <laughs> so not really looking for groups that are opposing it maybe there might be some i don't know if they would have a whole lot of like backing at this point so, so it's more like the uh, you're you're still finding there are other groups that support it but it hasn't gotten big enough for them to latch on to and try to stop other than maybe again the ontario pcs with the ford who interestingly enough like campaigned on a promise of not stopping the basic income project so <laughs> even he was sort of kind of for it at one point but yeah, and I think he's kind of like playing around with his foot in his mouth now, like seeing what happened with CERB. And, and also like the, a lot of people came forward that were very appreciative of the program, from what I understand in Ontario. I did see some articles here and there about that. No, I, I haven't seen like anything where it's like this massive movement to counter basic income. I just haven't seen any group like gaining big steam for that. It's sort of emerging like we're the anti-basic income group. We need to bring this in to make sure people have less money so that our economy can collapse in a pandemic. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, there were, uh, and even before that, like before the pandemic, I didn't see any like massive movement against it. I, I talked to people that were kind of questioned it. And it's like, well, aren't people just going to sit on their butts and just drink booze and you know, smoke weed and stuff and they're not going to do anything uh, with this? And, and well, I think that's the sort of thing where like, yeah. same thing with the legalization of weed, right? When before it was legalized, there were people in Canada who thought that but once weed is legalized, at least a significant portion of the economy is just going to sit around and smoke pot and we're going to fail as a nation economically because we're all going to be high and we're not going to want to do anything and yet other than the pandemic which I mean that did happen a little bit with the pandemic but other than that everything was fine like the economy continued we are still had an oil sands we still did all the things we were doing before only there was just 
some people getting high sometimes, right? It didn't cause an economic collapse or anything. People used it recreationally, uh, same as people use alcohol. It's a comparable thing. It's a legal, legally controlled substance now that people can partake in if they want to. They can go to their local cannabis shop and get some if they want. The same as if you would go to a liquor store and buy some beer or something like that. It hasn't caused a collapse of the economy or anything. So, you know, it's uh, an overreaction, basically. When people don't understand things, sometimes people take like a hard stance and you gain some something when they don't really uh, look into what it exactly is all about. But now, like you said, a lot of people now have that personal experience of having money given to them, <laughs> where it's like, this makes sense. I needed this money and other people needed this money too. Like with the service, it's helping me and my family. It, this, this makes a whole lot of sense. You, you don't see a, like, a, there's people that want to go back to work. They got the serve, but they're not going like, oh, I just want to be on serve permanently. People, they need like a, a bit of a, a step up just to keep them going, to get them on their feet. Most people are going to be wanting to do something with their lives and go get an education or go back to work or something. Most people are not going to be going like, oh, I got free money. I'm just going to sit on my butt here. That's on top of that. Like, I think some of that, and again, it's someone who's like had a little bit of money and has lived the life where I could if I wanted to just quit and post on my savings for quite a while. Like... After a while, you start getting bored and you want to yeah. go back to work. You really exactly. like, there are a lot of jobs that are just terrible jobs and maybe nobody's going to want to do them, etc. But like, there's things that you're going to want in life, like a better car, a better house. Like, there's lots of things that serve isn't going to get you and it's never going to get, and no basic income, or at least not in the near term, is going to get you. And that work is going to be the means whether it's starting your own business so you can afford it or just working the 40 hours a week, even at minimum wage, like it gets you further. And people, especially once you get used to living with a certain standard of living, a certain amount of healthy food, you're going to want to go and go out into the world and arrange your affairs to get these things that just make life better, right? Yeah, basic income, it's not, you know, you're not living luxury like with it. It's just a basic amount of money to get you by, basically, to keep your head above water. Right. That's what it is. And it allows you to be able to, instead of being in a panic about how you're going to live, you have the time to go like, you can plan out your life then. And you can go, this is what I can do to get my life on track and to get things going. Rather than being in panic mode and not being able to make a living and just going deeper and deeper under. Right. And also on top of that, with the panic mode, we make bad decisions when we're panicked. And yeah, one of the right. problems in living in poverty is that like everything is a crisis. And everything requires you to make that snap judgment at the time so you can make that next meal, you can make that next bottle of formula, you can get that next set of diapers, right? Like, And there are opportunities that sometimes take a little bit of careful thought and a little bit of extra time to, to sit on and brew on and think, okay, well, should I do it this way or this way? And even just like the level of stress involved in having to be living in that crisis mode all the time, it impacts even at the level of your how your brain works and whether or not you're able to think clearly and being able to have just that little bit of relief from that stress permanently, which a permanent basic income system would do, it would hopefully decrease that stress just a little bit, right? That alone yeah. would have huge benefits. Well, it depends. That speaks to people's mental health. Yeah. Like if you're having so much stress in your life, it, it can impact like depression. It can make your depression worse. If you haven't got the money to pay for your medication to deal with mental health issues that you might have, then you do that. You might ha end up having to self-medicate by turning to alcohol and trying to drink your problems away because you haven't got, you can't afford your meds or anything like that. You can't afford getting uh, access to proper food or anything that you might need. Instead, it's like you end up making the worst possible choices because you haven't got the money to help you to, to be able to make the, the right choices and be able to do the things that you need to do to make to improve your quality of life and improve your health. And it's a spiraling situation. And it turns into, well, for some people, it might turn to how am I uh, going to be able to pay for things? It might turn to, to crime in some cases. It might turn people into turning to suicide because it's like, I can't deal with these things. Right. And it has an impact on that person. And that person dies and it impacts their family it's a domino effect if you put something in place to prevent those dominoes from falling it'll improve things but if you go like nope 
you know, will just depend on a scattershot approach with a little nip and tuck here that really isn't making any big real difference and hope things will just keep chugging along. And we've seen what's happening in that inequality is increasing. Uh, we're seeing uh, mental health issues are increasing. We're having, seeing a bigger burden on the mental health system and child poverty. That's in, uh, increasing as well. So it's, it's a domino effect. It has its impacts. So I did want to, at least at some point today, get a little bit on the Saskatchewan provincial election. And so as far as the election went, what was your sense of why the SAS party did so well? And why the Greens, for example, didn't take a seat? And why did the NDP do as well as they did from, from your vantage point? Before we get too too late here, I would say because people didn't really have a choice. That's why they turned, still turned to the Saskatchewan party, like in a big way, because the NDP didn't really have much. It was very challenging, or it didn't have much of a vision. Basically, it was sort of a safe approach type platform that they had. It wasn't very inspiring. It didn't reach out in a big way, like the rural communities. I didn't feel that, or, or really see that. And and, and again, this party, is someone who you were campaigning in the rural communities yourself. So, yeah. like, on that side, did you do anything different in terms of trying to appeal to the people out there in that particular constituency that show them how to do it, or is it just, in retrospect, seeing that they failed at it, etc.? Well, just reaching out to people in rural communities, like, you look at, I'm talking, like, to, like, mental health supports and stuff, there's very little of that, actually, in rural communities. There's a, a lack of, like, mental health services, which is very, uh, very bad to see. There's a, a lack of opportunity when it comes to businesses. And that speaks to internet services, like connectivity is uh, really needs improvement. That impacts like business and healthcare and job opportunities in rural communities. Uh, I know there were uh, some promises, I believe in the NDP platform in regards to improving like rural connectivity. You didn't hear them talk a lot about that though. Like it wasn't played up in the media a lot. And so they didn't uh, speak a lot on that regard or uh, like what they were going to do like, to address like opioid issues or mental health, like in rural communities. That was nothing. That was like, I, I, that was pretty much missing from what I could understand from the platform with the NDP. This is a Saskatchewan party that they just used the same drum beat and it worked hammering people on, look at what the NDP did. They took away your hospitals. They did this to ruin uh, rural communities. So in uh, the bad old days under the NDP, you know, our economy was in such bad shape. So it worked. Like the Saskatchewan party trotted that out again. And people just still clung to the Saskatchewan party because they didn't see any, any other real choice. Like the NDP was really speaking to, in a big way, to reach out to rural communities and what was happening there. But like rural communities are shrinking. Uh, younger people are moving away. They're moving to the bigger centers. The NDP seemed more to have like an urban-centric type of uh, view, it seemed like. And, uh, and that they were is doing. borne out in the results. Like, the yeah. NDP did good in the cities. Like, realistically, did. if yeah. this whole province was cities, the way the NDP did it here in Saskatoon and Regina, it would have been an NDP majority province. But it wasn't because there's this somehow or a difference between what the NDP was saying to the cities to appeal to the voters there and what they were saying to the people in the rural areas. Some message either wasn't getting through, they weren't saying the right thing, or they weren't. Something went wrong there. And it's definitely worth thinking about on that side. But is there any last thing that you'd like to tell the world now that you have the world's attention? Uh, well, I would say don't give up hope, like with the whole situation, like with, well, here in Saskatchewan, maybe seeing the results of Saskatchewan party game yet. Some people are kind of discouraged with COVID, seeing that people are maybe feeling a little like things are uh, spiraling out of control don't give up hope hang on to that hope we can turn things around like the greens are we're actively working on, on a grassroots level to listen to what people are saying like in not just in urban areas but rural too we're building up constituency associations we want to hear what people have to say we want to have that personal connection with people and i think people need to get out of their ivory towers like in uh, the, uh, the bureaucracy of the different political parties and see what you can do to improve people's lives on the ground, what you can do to address fears of losing jobs or speaking to the Buffalo Party, feeling that you're out of control, like uh, that your province is going to be taken away from you. You know, those are fears that we need to address, but we need to work with everybody, Indigenous communities, like 
You see, they were ignored in the speech from our premier. He just spoke to the separatists. You can't just speak to just one particular group. You need to be working for everybody in the province. So we need to have hope. We need to work together at a basic level on the ground and get to know and trust each other again. That's the only way we can move the problems forward is by doing that. And it's going to get more and more important, I think, to be able to build that baseline trust as our civilization and society and province specifically become under more and more pressure as time goes by with this COVID, and especially as mentioned, the U.S. election, however that turns out. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah. thank you very much, Larry, for coming on again. Wish you luck with your basic income coalition work uh, going forward. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this broadcast and want to find out more about basic income, I'm going to try to post links wherever this video is posted. When I go do the editing as well, there is a subscribestar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff that is available for you to support this show specifically. And if you out there have anyone else you'd like me to talk to, to get perspectives on these sorts of things, definitely get in touch. But with that, I will fade off and I will see you all next week.